so good morning. Welcome, everybody. We'll be starting the first session. Uh, we'll invite all of the speakers to come up one by one, and you can have a seat with us uh, and stay on the stage for questions at the end. Uh, so we'll start with uh, Dr. Sydney Levi, our one and only nuclear medicine and radiologist from Peter Mac. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, PSMA PET CT in the primary staging of prostate cancer. So, without further ado, let's get going. No conflicts of interest. So, at the moment, there are four tracers that are in widespread use around the world. One of them is a gallium based tracer, three of them are fluorinated. We tend to use the first two, gallium PSMA11, and uh, we often call it fluorinated PSR. Uh, the other two, more international. It's worth remembering that only three of them are FDA approved at the moment, as indicated, uh, with 1007 not yet FDA approved. So, Pro-PSMA was uh, one of the trials that really got us going in terms of proving that PSMA PET-CT was an invaluable tool in primary staging. Uh, it was a multi-centre uh, trial, prospective, randomised, uh, multi-readers, uh, and it had 302 patients. And the main purpose here was to prove that PSMA PET-CT was more useful than bone scan and CT to stage prostate cancer and it achieved that purpose. So essentially, it was 27% more accurate than conventional imaging in uh, staging prostate cancer, nodal or distant METs. This led to a greater treatment impact, as indicated, and fewer uncertain results compared with conventional imaging, as well as some uh, extra benefits, less radiation overall, high reporter agreement, no adverse effects seen, and frankly, a lot easier to read in clinical practice. There were also three international trials which were essential in helping to establish the exact accuracy of PSMA PET-CT against histology as a gold standard. And uh, these were out of uh, essentially America and Europe. Uh, we've got the Thomas Hope study, which was led out of UCSF uh, with European centres. We've got the Osprey study, which uh, was uh, an American-Canadian collaboration. And we've got the Lighthouse study, which was an American-European collaboration. Now, to try and summarise all this data, uh, fortunately, there was a lot of uniformity uh, in terms of results. And uh, they all compared against pelvic lymphadenectomy as a, as a gold standard, so the histopathology. Uh, this, there were slight differences in patient eligibility, uh, particularly the Osprey study focused more on high risk groups, whereas the other two were more intermediate risk and high risk. But even in spite of this, the specificity was remarkable, 95% or plus in all trials. And these are all trials with 250 to 300 patients, so very well powered. The sensitivity, not surprisingly, uh, PET-CT has limitations in terms of resolution and low sensitivity was achieved. So it's just important to remember that just because we don't see something on PSMA PET-CT, it doesn't mean that there isn't micrometastatic disease. The positive predictive values were slightly different and again, the main reason for that was here in the Osprey study, they focused more on high risk groups. So that increased the positive predictive value somewhat. Um, but very, very importantly, compared to conventional imaging, the extra pelvic M1 lesions, there was a significant rate of pickup of these lesions which would never have been seen otherwise on conventional imaging. And the other thing to remember is it did cover the gallium and the fluorinated traces, so what's in widespread use uh, worldwide. This led to some appropriate use criteria, so an expert working group were surveyed on various scenarios of when do we use PSMA PET-CT? And this was done as a, a scoring system where if you scored seven to nine and there was consensus, it was considered an appropriate use of the test. So as of 2024, and this is still changing, uh, appropriate use criteria are unfavorable, intermediate or high risk prostate cancer with or without negative or equivocal findings on conventional imaging for oligometastatic disease. 
Now, there was also some work done on cost effectiveness. This was part of the pro-PSMA trial and it was a prospectively defined econ economic evaluation embedded in the clinical trial. And in the Australian setting, and I stress it does vary markedly depending on where you come from, but in the Australian setting, PSMA PET-CT came out $200 cheaper per patient compared with conventional imaging, which was a very important thing to uh, outline because a lot of people thought it would not be the case beforehand. What have we learned about the staging that we have performed so far using PSMA PET-CT? This is some data that's come out of long-term follow-up at four years from the pro-PSMA trial, and it has shown that baseline nodal staging with PSMA PET-CT is prognostic for medium-term oncological outcomes. Now, what does that mean? So, an oncological outcome was defined as time to metastasis, introduction of salvage therapy, or biochemical recurrence, the strict definition. And what it did show was that uh, particularly at three years, just here, I'll draw your attention to this, people who had N1 disease at baseline had a significantly higher rate of adverse oncological outcomes compared with N0 disease. Whereas people who had conventional imaging, there was no difference. It didn't make a, a difference whether you were classified as N1 or N0 at baseline imaging. So that's important, just to see the long-term effects of this imaging. What does it mean? This helps to show what it means. M-staging, it's redefining what we call metastatic burden. We've all been living with this definition uh, from the charted trial in 2015 of oligometastatic disease. It's defined the introduction of a lot of different treatments, such as particularly in radiation oncology. But PSMA PET-CT is throwing that all, all over the place. And we now have to be flexible because we don't yet have the literature to say exactly what oligometastatic disease and extensive metastatic disease should be in the PSMA PET-CT era. And we, we simply have to wait. But for the moment, we need to be flexible as clinicians as to who deserves treatment and who doesn't, because the old definition is a bit out of date. And we're even looking at T-staging for PSMA PET-CT. It was traditionally the domain of MRI, but we're seeing, as I'm sure many of you will have noticed, large agreement between MRI and PSMA PET-CT. We've got a nice PIRADS-5 lesion there in the right posterior peripheral zone, intensely PSMA avid, and the majority of the time that's what we see. And when we don't see that, the first thing I think of in clinical practice is are they both read correctly? So I need to look at it again and decide whether, because uh, they usually do agree, not always, but usually. We can sometimes add extra information, like this is a, an example, for instance, of macro EPE, nicely shown on the MRI here but also shown, uh, as if you have a look at the CT here, there's all this soft tissue which is beyond the confines of the prostatic capsule. So, again, you have to be a little careful. Sometimes I use uh, terminology such as suspected, or I, I won't always come down hard on this, but you can add useful information that way. And particularly with regards to upstaging people to T3B, if you see seminal vesicular invasion on a PET scan, that's very helpful because sometimes that can be difficult to call on MRI, and that's a really important uh, game changer in terms of subsequent management. False positives are important. Um, we always have uh, fractures, benign bone lesions, pagets, degenerative geodes, autonomic ganglia, and a long, long list of other cancers. I mean, my, my first question is, is there other cancers which aren't PSMA avid? Because so many of them have some degree of PSMA avidity, and of course, hemangiomas. Just one little thing for those who are using 1007, there, are, there is a feeling that there is a slightly higher risk of um, false positive bone findings. So that's something, just watch this space, we need to sort of uh, uh, establish its exact role over the next year or two. And lastly, it's worth remembering that uh, even if findings are equivocal, PSMA PET-CT still results in less false positives in metastatic disease. And it doesn't matter if you're a sensitive reader or a more specific reader. So that's really helpful. It still has the advantage over bone scanning. Lastly, I'd like to remind everyone, no test is perfect and PSMA PET-CT is no exception. 
This is a nasty Pyrads 5 lesion which came back as a Gleason 8. It had no PSMA uptake at all, but plenty of FDG uptake. So always remember FDG, keep it in the toolkit. There'll be others speaking on this later on. Thanks to Peter Mack, thanks to Prostic, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>